and Boston. Allow me to reiterate uh, uh, the note by my colleagues at uh, the British Institute of International and uh, Comparative Law and uh, welcome you to the WTO conference, which has now led many years uh, and has a legacy, a certain legacy of addressing some of the pressing challenges, most pressing challenges in uh, international trade. Um, I think our session is especially uh, important, not only because it's uh, such a distinguished panel, but uh, the feelings are generally getting heightened about the United States role in this uh, new brave world that we're living in. And uh, with a hope or an aim to just hear where are we going one way or another. Uh, before I introduce uh, our uh, distinguished guests, I would also sort of remind everyone about the note that Sir Francis mentioned in his opening remarks, uh, which said that the US now reflects narrow nationalism, which has become infectious. Uh, the point has been made several times about the importance of the rule of law, and I'm sure most of you would agree that our judicial uh, uh, members and individuals here from the UK have expressed a general concern about uh, the state of affairs, especially in relation to international law. Uh, my perspective when it comes to America is mostly, uh, I don't know if you can see it, you probably can't. This is Alexis de Tocqueville's view about American democracy. So it'll always be an outsider's, uh, but always an admirer. Um, first and foremost, we have uh, Professor Mark Wu who is the Henry L. Timpson Professor and Vice Dean for the Graduate Program and International Legal Studies at Harvard Law School. He conducts research on in international trade and international economic law. His writings cover a range of topics, including the impact of emerging economies on global governance, digital technologies, trade remedies, environment, and foreign investment. Mark also serves on the advisory board of the WTO chairs program. He is principal liaison to the trade and environment policy advisory committee. He has presented his research before several international organizations, including the G20, OECD, UNCTAD, World Bank and WTO. Welcome Mark. Ambassador Charlie Reese is vice president international at RAND as well as senior fellow leading projects on the economic effects of Brexit, the costs of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and national security decision-making among others. He has over three decades in the US diplomatic service, including ambassadorials uh, and assignments that include overseeing economic sections at the US embassy in London and the US mission to the European Union he also served as Deputy Assistant U.S. Trade Representative for North American Affairs and was a member of the NAFTA negotiating team. He was also Executive Vice President of the Clinton Bush Haiti Fund. He is the recipient of the State Department's Cordell Hull Award for Senior Economic Officers, the Distinguished Honor Award, Presidential Meritorious Service Award, the Rockwell uh, Sean Ball is that in my, I'm probably not pronouncing it right, award for US EU relations and several superior honor awards. Uh, last but certainly not least is Stephen Vaughn, who is a partner in the international trade team of King and Spalding. He works primarily on international trade litigation and policy matters. In April 2019, Stephen completed more than two years of service as general counsel for the office of the USTR. In that position, he managed a team of government attorneys representing the US interests in both trade negotiations and trade litigation. 
Those were very critical years in the Trump administration. During two months in early 2017, Stephen also served as the acting USDR. He is widely regarded as one of the world's foremost authorities on current US trade policy, as well as one of the most talented US trade remedy litigators. Welcome with us. Mark, can I ask you to start us off? Um, tell us how you see it from the other side of the Atlantic as a, an international trade scholar. Where was it? Where is it going? What do we learn from all of this? Well, thank you very much, uh, Malik, and uh, thank you very much to Bickel. Uh, it's an uh, honor and pleasure to be with you all uh, today. Uh, I only wish that we were actually physically gathered in London, but uh, I did make sure to have some crumpets and tea this morning, so at least I could feel as though I was there. Um, some of you uh, on this webinar uh, will have been part of the 2016 conference that uh, Tom Graham and I organized uh, at Harvard uh, that drew attention to the fact that uh, the US uh, felt as though the current WTO multilateral system uh, was not in balance. Uh, I think it's tempting uh, to look at what's happening in the US today and to apply the simple lens of uh, there's globalists uh, or multilateralists versus populists or economic nationalists and to apply these types of labels. But uh, the first thing uh, that I would articulate to this audience is uh, you of anyone uh, should be aware that while it may be popular political rhetoric to cast this as economic nationalism, uh, the sentiments about this lack of balance and a need to uh, reconstitute uh, not just the WTO system, but the overall international economic architecture uh, in a way that reflects our changing times. Uh, that's a sentiment that is uh, widely shared uh, across the political spectrum in the United States. Uh, we may differ as to what the right tactics may be, but the diagnosis that there is a problem is one uh, that predates the Trump administration, as those of you who were here in Cambridge uh, in 2016 will know, uh, and uh, will last beyond the Trump administration, uh, whether uh, that is in, a, uh, in 2021 or 2025 or whatever time frame uh, that may be. Uh, so I think it's important to sort of start by saying, uh, what does the United States uh, view as out of whack? or where has the system uh, gone uh, off the rails a bit? And I think the earlier sessions today uh, certainly did allude to the need for reform in many parts, but uh, in many ways, people tend to look at it as almost a checklist. Uh, the US uh, wants this, uh, this needs to get fixed, this needs to get fixed. And we don't take the three steps back to look at, is the architecture working for what the system itself is designed to do? And so the topic that you asked me to touch on uh, was uh, whether or not uh, we need a new Bretton Woods, uh, what that might look like, uh, or whether we're at another Bretton Woods type of moment, uh, or whether we can expect more of the same. And what I would argue more of the same is a drift towards right, more managed trade, uh, more uh, bilateral or regional cooperation, a greater web, a diminished role uh, for the WTO, but one which the WTO will still continue to function, right? And an increasing resource to uh, a, a resort to other forms of economic statecraft in order to manage that type of relationship. So let's just sort of say that that is what more of the same would be, but more of the same is certainly dynamic and would cut in a type of uh, trajectory that we have seen uh, over the last three years uh, and so forth. Uh, and what I would say to the question that you posed to me is if we look back, there's a temptation for us to look at the present moment and see it as one continuous line uh, from Bretton Woods to today. And so we certainly talk about the Bretton Woods system, uh, but in some ways, uh, 1994, uh, or 95, right, if you want to use January 1st uh, as the date there, uh, was a, uh, a redefinition or sort of a 2.0 version of what Bretton Woods was in the sense that it really did uh, allow for a much uh, more 
a defined set of rules, expansive and more consigned type of uh, dispute settlement and so forth. And so it's important to state that because the U.S. commitment to the Bretton Woods moment as defined in 1944, as opposed to 1994, uh, has, I think, remained quite strong, right? The resort to some forms of multilateralism, uh, a rules-based system, uh, principles of open trade and so forth, uh, but preserving uh, sovereign flexibility to make adjustments as is necessary in line with one's domestic system and so forth. I think that has uh, remained quite consistent. What has always been weaker and what has sort of um, fallen uh, has been this commitment to the post-1994 system or the strong, thick rules-based uh, binding dispute settlement nature uh, that uh, comes in place there. And I think the US very much felt as though that was conditional on a other set of uh, acknowledgements uh, in terms of flexibilities, particularly with regard to trade remedies, particularly a need to make adjustments as different forms of economic competition arose. And that uh, other side of that bargain has not been preserved, which has led to a stasis uh, in the system as it is. Uh, that's not the only thing which has fallen short, right? The other has been, of course, the negotiating arm of the WTO uh, has, uh, while not been completely moribund because we do have the trip facilitation agreements and uh, we have seen progress on fisheries and so forth, uh, has been perhaps much less uh, ambitious and accomplished much less than one might have hoped over the course of the last uh, 25 years. Uh, as a result of that, right, the rules are outdated. Uh, and perhaps more importantly, the rebalancing in terms of trade liberalization that as countries gained uh, in the global trading system, uh, they would open up more uh, and they would take a more of a leadership role. We have not seen that. Uh, we heard Dwayne Layton speak on the earlier panel about how there is, of course, a China problem, uh, which I, of course, uh, have written, as well as many others here, about the ability of WTO rules to apply to China's unique economic structure. But I would say that the issues that I just highlighted here are not specific to China. Right? They extend across the board, but certainly China's rise has accentuated a set of problems that existed in the post-1994 system, uh, regardless of uh, what one might think uh, about uh, how the WTO should interface uh, with China. Uh, on top of that, uh, the inability to deal with the uh, emerging areas of trade uh, has meant that uh, the rules of the road have become less and less clear in areas that are most vital uh, for national security. And here I'm speaking specifically about the digital realm, but I'm also speaking on the genetic, uh, uh, genetic biotech, all of these types of new emerging technologies. Uh, and there is an increasing worry, although there is still a debate in the United States about whether that security risk is one that is purely offshore or threatens uh, the type of uh, security that is critical towards uh, the US domestic homeland and a values-based system that the US has always preserved as you alluded to uh, in de Tocqueville that has in some ways always been a bit unique from the rest of the world. Uh, so that is the situation uh, here in the United States. Uh, I think there is a difference in terms of tactic, in terms of uh, what needs to be done on that. I think there is an acknowledgement on the part of all Americans that certainly what we have done at home in terms of the programs to support those who have lost out on trade uh, have perhaps not been nearly as adequate uh, as one might have hoped. Uh, and that there is a need to uh, rebuild the infrastructure and other uh, sort of soft, uh, soft uh, structures that are necessary, uh, whether that's education uh, or uh, job retraining and so forth, uh, that to increase U.S. economic competitiveness. Uh, certainly, I think the U.S. realizes there's a lot that needs to do at home that would buttress its position. But regardless of whether that agenda is accomplished at home and what tactics are used to accomplish that, right, there is something that the U.S. sees out of whack with the world at large for the system to rebalance. Uh, I will step then, although this is the WTO conference, I will step then away 
from the WTO realm for a bit. Uh, we can see then the other issues with regards to uh, currency, with regards to cybersecurity, with regards to uh, overcapacity and so forth. Uh, while these are not strictly WTO issues, we've certainly seen the global governance uh, framework fall short in terms of being able to preserve uh, some balance there. And uh, the US view from Washington would be at least to argue there have been certain actors uh, in the global system which are taking advantage of the lack of rules there or the lack of clarity over rules there uh, to uh, impose a set of what might be in their own national self-interest but have negative spillover effects uh, onto the rest of the world. And that, when that translates both in terms of economics, uh, in terms of job loss, in terms of reduced innovation, in terms of uh, national security risks, uh, that poses a question to the U.S. as to whether or not uh, the U.S. Uh, needs to take tactics uh, unilaterally or perhaps in conjunction with its allies to readdress this balance as opposed to trying to work this out through the multilateral system which has proven uh, somewhat in, unable to deal with these moments uh, over the course of not just the last decade but the course of the last generation. Uh, that I think is the diagnosis. The question here then is what is the prescription right for the diagnosis and I cast the diagnosis as is because I realize that when I'm across the Atlantic or when I'm in Tokyo or Beijing uh, the diagnosis that uh, those of you who are listening right from uh, the rest of the world will say wow that's a very American and not the way we see the problem with the system right we do see that there is a problem with the system but that's not the way we see it and so I think it's important first to acknowledge right the diagnosis of what's wrong is a little bit different here in Washington uh, than in the rest of the world particularly Brussels uh, Beijing and Tokyo uh, but that being said, right, there is a robust debate here in Washington uh, uh, and in the US in general over what should we do about that. And I think you'll hear some different perspectives on this panel. But what I will say to your question about whether or not a new Bretton Woods is possible uh, or is necessary uh, is the following. I think there's two ways we could look at what was Bretton Woods. Uh, one is to say, of course, it was a deal reached between uh, two uh, powers, one rising, uh, one incumbent, uh, with different forms of political as well as economic organization to find some means to interface and meet in the middle for the sake of global welfare, uh, enhancing global welfare. Uh, if that's your definition, you can substitute out the players, uh, but I don't think uh, that form of a new Bretton Woods is possible. And the reason I say that is because uh, it's clear the uh, we're in the midst of a major technological uh, transformation with industrial implications as well as security implications, what right, the World Economic Forum refers to as the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, the way the rising power, China, looks at uh, managing those platforms, uh, whether we're talking about digital internet governance and so forth, or even with regards to genetic information, biotechnology and so forth, is very different than the way the US or I would argue many other Western societies look at it. And it's difficult at this stage to come to some forms of an interface to reach a sort of rules in the middle. Uh, in some ways, I would argue it was just equally, would have been as equally difficult in 1904 right, for the US and Great Britain to have sat down and to try to reach some types of understanding about imperial preferences or about MFN or anything along those lines. Uh, we simply are too far apart to be able to reach some form of a common ground as far as that notion of Bretton Woods is concerned. But there is another understanding of Bretton Woods, which is to say Bretton Woods was about like-minded allies, as different as the US and the UK were, right, as far as their political and economic organization was concerned, even in 1944, uh, that it was a response to something even more foreign, even more alien, and that would have been, right, the socialist uh, 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 economic uh, security threat that that posed. And it was a means by which to shape a common understanding to bridge the differences uh, across these allies in order to uh, buttress uh, their own systems. Uh, that's an open question really to my friends across the Atlantic as to whether or not that type of Bretton Woods project is possible. I think it's difficult 
without a partner on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, in other words, asking who is the equivalent of a Lord Keynes, right, who would be able to supply both the intellectual as well as the domestic heft to convince uh, domestic stakeholders who are reluctant about this project about the need to engage in that. And I think I've spoken about, I think Washington remains open to that form of an idea, but uh, its counterpart on the other side, on the other side of the Atlantic is not quite there. And it's unclear whether or not uh, in Brussels, in London, in Berlin, Paris, and so forth, uh, that counterpart exists to think about a new economic architecture in the wake of these types of changes. Uh, I think it will be difficult to forge that across the Pacific, uh, although there are, and we've seen an attempt to try to do so through the TPP, uh, but at the end of the day, right, across the Pacific, as much as those are allies uh, that the US may have, as much as we face a set of common trade issues, uh, the closest and the proximity and the fact that these economies will continue to be integrated uh, with China will mean uh, and as well as their own domestic uh, similarities uh, to, in some ways, uh, economic organization and so forth, right, which the Chinese reform agenda has borrowed from, uh, will mean that as, uh, uh, as uh, Li Xianlong uh, eloquently put it in foreign affairs recently, right, uh, they do not want to take sides, but rather wish to serve as a bridge to try to make this work out. Uh, so I think uh, if uh, the second form of a Bretton Woods moment cannot take place, then I think, uh, unfortunately, right, we will see more of the same. And that more of the same will be a challenge to the post-94 international economic order. Uh, it will put Washington in a difficult position over how to manage its alliances. Uh, but it, I think uh, it, uh, and we will have a robust domestic debate in the US over those forms of a tactic, which I'll let my uh, fellow panelists here elaborate further upon. Uh, but that in short is the way I would frame uh, the situation right now uh, across the Atlantic here in the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And as we receive the message here uh, across the Atlantic, we wonder if we are going to be able to provide the intellectual capital that you're talking about as we are in a state of survival. But uh, let me ask you a question or two. I know we need to move faster, but I don't wanna miss the opportunity to ask you about trade and climate change or multi a multilateral agenda that can meet some, at least raise up to, to at least sixth or seventh place in everything that's going on in the world. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think climate change is another example of a major international governance issue where at least the economic side of it has uh, fallen short in terms of meeting a global challenge. Uh, I'm optimistic to some extent that uh, we may see greater commitments uh, on that front. But the difficulty here is that those rules, even if they're sector specific, have spillover effects. And so there, uh, and the difference in terms of understanding what's a permissible subsidy, to what end, how is that provided and so forth. Um, I fear that in the inability to deal with the overcapacity issue that we saw, particularly on solar panels, right? We squandered the ability of the trade regime to deal with climate change in a uh, manner for the better part of, uh, I would say at least for the near term, uh, because I think that really, uh, at least in the US highlighted uh, where there was a clear understanding, right? That there's obviously benefits to cheaper solar panels, but, uh, not a beggar thy neighbor type of policy to be applied there uh, and where there are real job losses and so forth. I think it uh, has really sort of uh, led the US perhaps to be much less ambitious about that. Now, I think in the, across the Atlantic uh, on uh, border adjustments, there's renewed attention to that, particularly uh, in this current commission. It will be interesting to see uh, whether there's new momentum that can be gained in the US on that concept. And if so, uh, what that might lead, but that would be along the lines of that second Bretton Woods type of model that I would uh, offer there. Uh, 
right? And I think that remains to be determined, but that's one issue where perhaps the ball is here on, uh, in the US, right? To decide what uh, US is willing to commit to as far as the uh, domestic climate change policies are concerned. And we'll have to wait to see how that shapes out before we have spillovers uh, onto the global governance scheme. Thank you so much, uh, Mark. Um, uh, Ambassador Rees, uh, if I can ask you to speak uh, now and tell us about a little bit how you see it from the perspective of someone who served, uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the State Department, which has a long legacy of being at the forefront of such activities, but has certainly been hollowed out in so many ways. Uh, I'd love to hear your views uh, as to an agenda whether it's a G20 agenda or a G2, as China would like it to be. <laughs> I think you're on mute, by the way. Thank you very much, Malik. And it's a pleasure and honor to take part in this uh, uh, this dialogue. And I hope we have time to get uh, comments from others. I, I'd like to, I think, pick up where Mark left off. Um, uh, I think it's right to think of the Bretton Woods and what Bretton Woods meant. And I would associate myself with the second definition of Bretton Woods, which was that it was essentially an organization uh, and um, uh, a, a, uh, a description of the way forward uh, amongst uh, countries uh, the, uh, other than the uh, Soviet Union, even before uh, Kennan and his containment theory emerged. And uh, it's probably fair to say that international economic cooperation, broadly speaking, uh, had a lot of successes uh, in the 70s, 80s, 90s. I mean, you think of the agreement to the energy sharing mechanism in the 70s that was the IEA. You think of uh, dealing with exchange rate imbalances, which uh, put at risk the entire international monetary um, system in the Plaza Accords in the 80s. Uh, you think of uh, the, the very redesign of the global trading environment that we're talking about today, uh, and other things were, were, were addressed in the 90s. And um, I think uh, we may be at, at such a moment again and need to feel, uh, to kind of go back to first principles and figure out how to deal with um, uh, the problems that we face and the emerging problems, the, the climate, the services, the uh, uh, industrial policy, uh, state enterprises in a broader context. And uh, rather than a G2 or um, uh, vesting hopes in the G20, I actually am a back to the future advocate. I think that we should uh, go back and look at the G7 of the classical period. Now, uh, those of you who are sort of G7 um, uh, historians may recall that the G7 was originally, of course, the G6 uh, in the meeting in Rambouillet and the Canadians weren't added until the, the year later. But for the first uh, roughly 20 years, uh, the G7 met annually uh, well-prepared through a Sherpa process uh, for outcomes and that were uh, those kinds of uh, positions of eco economic leadership that the seven plus the EU of course could take uh, to address the problems that the world faced. Uh, and uh, the in that classical period, the G7 uh, leaders had at their elbows, um, quite literally, the uh, ministers of foreign affairs and the ministers of finance, or when they were talking about trade, the trade ministers. That allowed them to do uh, good things uh, and to explore real solutions that then could be referred to other institutions for, um, uh, for carrying them out. Uh, what happened later, is uh, uh, somewhat uh, by guilt. Uh, there was a feeling that the uh, G7 itself was an elitist organization, needed more exposure to the developing world. Uh, that was politically useful. And so there were a variety of countries, South Africa and, and Brazil and others who were invited to G7 meetings. And then of course, also the Russians uh, became involved first as, as a P8 kind of political discussion after the G7 meetings, and then as a full member of the G8 um, uh, beginning in 1998, I think. Um, I think 
uh, we need to think about uh, reviving a G7, an effective G7 of the classical uh, genre, where the seven leading economies of the, uh, of the um, shall we say, developed, maybe even Western world, would get together and develop common views on these kinds of issues, how to deal with taxation of foreign source income, how to deal with uh, climate change border adjustments if you, if you need to, how to deal with um, the rural trading system, and then take those kinds of common perspectives into the broader institutions, the G20 or discussions with the Chinese in a, in a G2 type format, um, and, and uh, rely on the institutions with the impetus of support from major uh, member states uh, uh, to take forward uh, new arrangements for, um, uh, for dealing with contemporary problems. I don't feel that there is some immutable rule book that was agreed to sometime in the 1990s that should apply for all time, not be adjusted in domestic uh, sovereign context, we don't necessarily do that. We adjust our policies in light of new challenges and, and, uh, and uh, new political configurations and new economic uh, arrangements. And we should continue to do that in the international environment. We need to. But uh, the, the core of any new G7 is a, uh, a, a, an effective relationship between the United States of America and the European Union. Uh, that is uh, also means uh, an effective relationship between the United States and the major countries of the European Union, the France, Germany, and Italy that would be at the table in the G7, but also the UK, which is now leaving the European Union, but is still a major player. Uh, I think that those kinds of, uh, if you will, the Rambouillet model uh, of the way that the G7 uh, developed these kinds of perspectives could um, could help us uh, forward. Practically speaking, what I think this means is, as many know, um, everybody knows, I guess, the um, U.S. was in the chair of the G7 this year. Um, uh, we didn't take it particularly seriously even before the pandemic. Um, uh, after the pandemic, uh, the United States decided uh, to call off um, uh, the meeting that was to be held in September after being postponed from June because uh, uh, some uh, leaders wouldn't uh, commit to come in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, and so no effective G7 uh, process has taken place this year, which is a pity given uh, all the challenges that COVID and coordinated economic recovery have. What I would suggest uh, to the next administration, whether it's a second term of Trump or a, a new Biden administration, is that they sit, sit down with the UK, which would normally take in the rotation uh, the responsibility for hosting a G7 in, um, uh, in 2000, uh, 2021 and say, look, can we have a do over? Can we have a mulligan? Can we um, step forward and try and organize a G7 summit for the summer? early summer of 2021 in person and with an effective uh, uh, Sherpa process to deal in a quiet uh, way with all uh, a, a, a discrete set of, 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 of issues to kind of come up with some discrete ways forward on these things. Uh, which would include the WTO reform or how to reinvigorate the WTO in light of uh, the issues that we've been talking about all morning, but much more than that. Uh, the, the, the issues of, uh, of economic recovery, the issues of, uh, of climate as we've talked about um, and so forth. I think that something like that uh, could work and then could be multilateralized, if you will, uh, taken to the G20 that the Italians will host later in the summer and can move us forward. That uh, is concretely what I would uh, put forward as the prescription uh, for the diagnosis that Mark laid out. Um, Charlie, thank you very much for that very helpful process, sort of intelligence-oriented uh, uh, approach. Um, if I may ask you, how do you see um, this approach to trade policy, trade negotiation fitting with the American defense policy? 
it's easy to, to, to separate it theoretically, but certainly whether it's because of sales or engagement or NATO, or how, do you, how do you compartmentalize or bring them together? Well, I mean, many of the biggest issues that the G7 in the classical period had to deal with were uh, those kinds of uh, overlaps. My first big issue that I got involved in was the so-called Siberian gas pipeline issue of 1982 and 1983, where the United States uh, in its first real exercise of extraterritorial uh, application of sanctions tried to dissuade Europeans from uh, building the Amal gas pipeline. Um, it, it was it, it was in the first instance kind of a failure in that the European uh, foreign subs of, of GE decided to proceed anyway. But in the longer term, it was a bit of a success in that the uh, uh, the allies all agreed in the NATO format that it would be important to develop common approaches to export credits. Uh, to the Soviet Union and to energy security issues. And they directed the institutions uh, to develop those. So the OECD got export credits, the IEA got the, the, the relatively new IEA got the ex energy security stuff. We developed in those bodies uh, a set of principles that were then adapted and adopted by the G7 at Williamsburg in 83. Uh, that's why these kinds of, uh, uh, there, there should not be, you know, G, uh, today the um, uh, 5G uh, issue is a similar, both it has a, it has a commercial and economic Im implication, it also has a defense and security implication. These kinds of issues can be discussed effectively if you've got the right um, institution and you also, or the right, the right body. The, the virtue of the G7 is it isn't an institution. It is a rotating caucus that's small enough to get things done and has significant enough players that if they agree on something, uh, there are there are uh, th there is a basis for which to take it to other institutions and uh, and, and and bring it through with other uh, players. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Uh, Stephen or Mr. Vaughn, uh, I'm, I'm particularly proud because uh, I've, you've been dubbed like the, the trade Hamilton or Hamiltonian in your approach. And I proudly went three times to like Hamilton, the original cast. But uh, <laughs> um, the floor is yours as you explain to us America's world. I think you're muted, by the way. Um, you've seen the stormy period, and uh, what insight can you tell us? Well, um, it's good that, that you've seen Hamilton. Uh, you will recall, of course, that at the end of the revolution in Hamilton, they all sing, uh, the world turned upside down, right? And I, I think it's very important if you're gonna understand these issues to understand American history um, and how Americans tend to look at things. So I, I actually wanted to start with something from uh, Democracy in America, since you, since you referenced Tocqueville. Um, and he talks about sovereignty and how, how the Americans feel about sovereignty in chapter four of um, Democracy in America. And here's what Tocqueville said. In some countries, a power exists which, though it is in degree foreign to the social body, directs it and forces it to pursue a certain track. In others, the ruling force is divided, being partly within and partly without the ranks of the people. But nothing of the kind is to be seen in the United States. There, society governs itself for itself. All power centers in its bosom, and scarcely an individual is to be met with who would venture to conceive or express the idea of seeking it elsewhere. And I think that if you're going to understand kind of what's been happening over the last few years, and I thought you know, both the professor and the, and the ambassador did a great job in terms of laying this out. You have got to accept that the Americans are brought up on this notion of absolute national sovereignty. The, the, the power of the United States belongs to the people of the United States. They get to pick the president, they get to pick the Congress, the president makes the laws, Congress, Congress passes the laws, the president executes the laws, and that's it. You, you will never hear an American elected official go on television and tell the American people, well, 
you know, I wanted to do this policy, but international law says I have to do this other policy. That's just never going to happen. And so um, this has led to issues in the past, obviously, when the U.S., you know, whether we walked away from the League of Nations or whether there were controversies over some of the things we did during the Cold War or controversies over some of the things we did during uh, the Iraq War. Um, there's always going to be tensions over this uh, view that the Americans take, but it is absolutely grounded in American life and in the American experience. Um, and, it, and anyone who seeks to talk to the Americans or, or negotiate with the Americans or uh, inter interact with the Americans uh, has to be prepared to take that into account. So um, I'm just going to make a few points kind of in addition to uh, the points which have already been made, which I think have been extremely helpful. Um, so if you kind of think about this from a law perspective, right, uh, as general counsel say of USTR, how do you look at these questions and what role does international law play in them? Well, it's a fairly, it's fairly limited, to be honest. The most important question from the perspective of an American president is, what are the powers that have been granted to the president under the Constitution? Uh, what are the powers that the Congress has? And, and then the president, if it, you know, is any president really is going to feel that their obligation is to use those powers in a way that will redound to the benefits of the American people. Now, I think, you know, Charles did a great job of explaining how um, things like G7 summits and cooperation with our allies and working together and coordinating policy, a lot of times that's very much in the interest of the American people. Um, and, and I think our history has shown that the Americans can be extremely flexible in terms of working with other countries and in terms of trying to build international cooperation. But that's something that we tend to do as a matter of policy and not as a matter of something that we're obliged to do or required to do by international law. So I think that, you know, from our perspective, the first question is, what are the president's authorities under, under the U.S. law? Um, and that's tended to be how what, that was the first question for us. And that's that's going to be the first question for any U.S. policymaker. Um, and, and then, you know, within that, obviously, you take the views of other countries into account. Um, and there's a lot of times when it makes sense to cooperate. But the first question always is going to have to be, what do you as an elected official see is in the best interest of the of the Americans? So. <clears throat> when you start talking about how does all of that kind of fit into the WTO, you know, I think Mark did a great job of explaining um, we're going to have this difficulty between sort of the way we tend to look at things and the way people in, say, Brussels tend to look at things. Um, we, you know, we felt like that when we joined the WTO, we agreed to a certain very specific set of rules um, that we committed to comply with, and the Americans believe that they have complied with those rules. But I think a lot of people in Europe, in particular, felt that we had agreed to a process uh, where we would accept whatever new judgments or rules came out of that process, whether it was, you know, through the appellate body or not. And, and that I don't think the Americans ever agreed to. Um, and the Obama administration raised this uh, in the context of, uh, you know, some of the vacancies that, that came up on the WTO appellate body, you know, even when they were in power. Um, and obviously, the, the, the Bush administration had raised it in concern with some of the cases uh, that where the decisions went against the U.S., such as, for example, the Steel Safeguards case. Uh, unfortunately, the concerns raised by the Bush administration and raised by the Obama administration were not taken, in my opinion, as seriously as they should be. Um, and there were still these expectations that whatever happened, the Americans were going to have to pretty much go along with whatever rulings came down from, from the appellate body. And that ended up having a big impact um, sort of in, in where things stand with the WTO today. So I think the real question is going to be, to what extent are other countries, and, and particularly the European Union, because I agree that that's, that's the key player here, to, to what extent are they prepared to work with the United States as it is? In other words, accept the fact that Americans are going to keep celebrating Independence Day. They're going to keep being the type of people that Tocqueville described. Uh, they're going to continue to believe that, for their perspective, it's absolutely vital that their elected officials be directly responsible to the voters. Um, 
And are we going to look for ways to work together, given those constraints on US policymakers? Or are we just going to keep beating our heads against the wall over this issue about, well, when's the United States going to give up sovereignty? When's the United States going to start doing what it's told? When's the United States going to start obeying international law? I just think that's honestly a, a kind of a, a, you know, it's not the most productive use of everybody's time. I think we're better off having practical, pragmatic conversations along the lines of what Charles talked about in the G7 context or, or you know, in whatever context makes the most sense. Uh, to, to look for ways that we can that we can work together. So, for example, um, when we talk about you know doing an FTA with the UK, um, you know that's an example where uh, I think you can see a lot of opportunities for cooperation. Um, for, we have a number of UK of FTAs with major economies now: Australia, Mexico, Canada, Korea. They've generally been popular here. I think they've generally been popular in the countries that that did those deals with us. Um, that's a framework that works really well uh, for the Americans. Uh, you get buy-in from Congress, um, and you can tend to have a longer and more stable uh, relationship that way. Um, so then I think, uh, you know, let me just make a few other points. I think there are a lot of opportunities here to work together on a lot of these issues. I think you're going to see that there's a strong bipartisan consensus that China creates these new challenges. And that as a result of these new challenges, it is very important that our that the European Union and our G7 partners uh, work with us in trying to, you know, find solutions. But I also think you're going to find that the Americans are going to be um, looking at all those questions through the framework of, uh, you know, each country sort of working within its own political system. That's why, if you notice, the Americans tend to use, we use languages like allies, right? In other words, they're, we're each sort of operating within our own system, um, but we're working together for a shared set of goals, um, as opposed to, you, you don't hear the Americans talk as much about, you know, getting, you know, having a common legal framework or having a common multilateral system, because that doesn't fit in as well with the way we tend to think about the world. Um, and so I think that's the real question. To what extent are other countries prepared to, to work with us and cooperate with us? I don't think it's going to be a simple question. I mean, but I think at the same time, I don't think we should be so romantic about how, how things were in the past, right? I think, you know, as, as Charles pointed out and as Mark pointed out, th these have been complicated issues for a really, really long time. Um, we had huge fights with the allies over Vietnam, over the missile programs in Western Europe, uh, over, you know, I mean, I can remember, I'm old enough to remember when there were huge marches in the streets in Germany against, you know, Reagan and his foreign policy. So we're not always going to agree. We're, we're not always going to be able to work together on everything. But I think it, what they did do in the, in the period, say, from 1946 to 1994, was they did a very good job of keeping things at a practical level and working together to, as much as they could, um, even if that meant having to do things like the Plaza Accord or um, you know, other things in order to deal with some of these uh, imbalances. So I would hope that, that we would move in, in that direction and have less sort of you know, uh, argumentation over uh, legal questions and kind of more practical conversations about policy questions. Thank you for that. Uh, before I open it for questions and, and, and also if there are comments by the other speakers, if, if I were to tell you, can I ask you this question? Let me frame it in a way and I, I beg for your indulgence. If I were to tell you that, you know, in the UK used to be, in terms of the trade dynamics, used to be in charge of pinning every agreement that brought America and Europe together. Now that it's not in that role, it's very hard to see who would mediate that conversation the way that you, that in a sense, that made the UK relevant, independent of Europe. What I'm struggling with, though, with in what you're saying is, in, 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 is 
is whether or not you genuinely and truly believe that the people around the world or other countries believe that they want the U.S. to let go of its sovereignty or any of its constitutional uh, arrangement or the constitution for that matter. And I think the other side of this point, this is America's world. These are the institutions and laws and tools and allies that America created. And it's not just GATT. I mean, even the Marshall Plan, which was a magnanimous act by the US, was done so that not only to help the EU, but also to manage uh, 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 Soviet intervention. Today, we're letting go of this whole system. And just as the US is formulating these bilateral and FTA treat agreements, China is doing that. And there are people, the allies in the middle, who genuinely be, want to be in the US side, but they're stuck because an African president, wherever he is, or in Central Asia or so on, they don't think they're going to get a call with the president even in the 200th day in a year. Do you really think that people are against uh, American sovereignty? Do you not see that this is part of the American design of the world? I mean, it's not limited to the continent. I mean, the US influence and assets and interests is all over the world. The only difference is countries didn't need to, presidents didn't need to be loved. They just understood their role in the world. I'm a little, I'm a little confused in terms of what, what you mean. I don't think anybody in America really believes that America runs the world. I mean, I don't think anybody really believes that America like made the world or created the world or set up the world or any of that. I think these were all, you know, hard fought negotiations. I mean, you know, Charles was there. A lot of these folks remember when we did the negotiations over over GATT or over the Uruguay round or over the Tokyo round or any round you want to mention. I don't think there's any examples of American history of the Americans just walking into the room and saying, okay, guys, here it is, just sign on. It was, it was never that. That's never what it was. De Gaulle was happy to pull, he, he pulled France out of NATO in 1968. Harold Wilson told Lyndon Johnson he wasn't going to support the U.S. in Vietnam in 1964. Um, it's, you know, we've had, we had arguments over the Plaza Accord. We had arguments over the Nixon shock in 1971. We had arguments over, you know, everything from Ford sales corporations to the subsidies for aircrafts to, you know, lots and lots of issues for a really, really long time. It's, it's just, you know, it was the, the idea that the U.S. was sort of, you know, uh, doing all this on its own or that the U.S. was paying for everything, that the U.S. was sort of propping everything up. That was never true. It was it was an alliance. Um, countries made their own decisions. The the idea that Western Europe was simply parroting what it was told, uh, I think if <laughs> I think if you ask Conrad Adenauer and De Gaulle and uh, you know people like that, Margaret Thatcher, well, did you just do whatever the Americans told you? I think they would all say no. We do what was in the interest of our country. So I think all we're saying is, is that there was, you know, there was obviously a time in the mid nineties where I think some people got overly enthusiastic and overly optimistic about how close we all really were. And there was a lot of books about we'd reached the end of history and we aren't gonna have these issues anymore. And it's just gonna be one system from now on. And I, I never believed that. I'm sure most people on this call never believed that. I think that was always exaggerated. Um, the people of Western Europe and the people of Asia, I mean, these are great, mighty cultures and civilizations that have lasted for hundreds and thousands of years. So the notion that America was just going to sort of, you know, call the tune and everybody was going to do what we told them, that was never the case. And it's naive to think it ever would be the case. I think what we're saying is not throwing out the system or tearing down the system or undermining the system. I think the question is, let's have real, honest conversations with each other along the lines of what Charles was talking about at a very, not just at a high level, but at, 
at, at what you would call the staff level, but also the conversations like this. We have to understand the reality of the situation. We sat over here and watched the UK and the EU talk past each other for years and years and years. And people tried to paper it over and tried to pretend it wasn't as bad as it was. And, and obviously now you see, you see what ended up happening. I think the more honest we are with each other and the more candid we are about what, what kind of a world we want to build, I think in the long run, that's a much more stable way of dealing with things. So what, one more hypothetical, because I liked your answer. So you are, Trump wins second term, you are USDR, and someone comes in, really wants to be nice, not to offend you in any way, but genuinely wants America and the USDR to take a leading role, whether in reforming the WTO or uh, creating a new multilateral system. How should they approach it? Well, I think Ambassador Lighthizer has put out a lot of ideas. Um, the Americans are, uh, you know, for example, just on the, let's just go through a couple of things. First of all, I think we would have to really think about uh, whether or not, um, how do we avoid creating a, a dispute settlement process that tries to create new rules and create new obligations, uh, even though the text clearly says that they're not supposed to be able to do that. That would be one issue you'd have to think about. I think another issue that the ambassador has raised in the past is um, when you look at the bound tariff rates, for example, uh, a lot of these bound tariff rates go back decades. I mean, literally go back to the early days of the Cold War uh, when the United States was in a situation where it, it, it may have been making some concessions to people, not necessarily for trade reasons, but for more foreign policy reasons. And, and we probably have to update all that. And we have to think about do those do those uh, bound tariff rates still make sense? I think a third thing that we would be interested in thinking about is um, what do we do, uh, to what extent can the WTO work on a plurilateral basis uh, as opposed to uh, a multilateral basis? Uh, do we really want to have a situation where you know, China has an effective veto on almost everything that we try to do inside the WTO or do we have you know, more uh, flexibility to work together on things. And I think those are the type of things that you know you would sort of see uh, the Americans be interested in talking about. Um, you know, I like I said, I think there's a you could see this with the USMCA, um, and you can sort of sort of see it in all the enthusiasm over here for the UK FTA. The Americans do not want to be isolated, they do not want to be alone. They want to work with the rest of the world, and they need to find a way to do it that will be, you know, in in our interest and, and in everybody else's interest. Thank you. This was very helpful. We have three questions, which uh, uh, I ask you to bear with me as I get them from Yolinda. But in in the meantime, maybe I didn't see the questions. Uh, <laughs> Um, Malik, uh, there is a Q and A uh, page at the bottom of the. There, there you go. See, Stephen. Now you know how old I am. <laughs> All right, I have a question about. Do you see it as well, Mark? About the DSU. So that I think is yours. And yes, we have. And you got two questions from Mark. Do you want to answer first? Um, sure, I, I'm happy to take a shot at it. Although I think the question posed by James on Article 1714 on DSU is one that was directed towards Stephen's remarks. So I'll defer on that question to Stephen. Um, the other questions which were posed to me uh, was one, uh, of course, uh, James is uh, always spot on, but let me just read the question for uh, everyone else, right? Um, he was, uh, uh, what he's saying is uh, he would hope that we, uh, both this panel, but also uh, America as a whole, would refrain from treating rule of law and American principles as a chicken and egg problem. And instead, right, sort of uh, discuss uh, in plain language, right? What are the ways we uh, need? To, what do we need to do to get out of the current impasse? And uh, whether or not the principle of pacta sunt servanda 
uh, needs to be upheld first. What's the point of new agreements if that's not being kept? And uh, what I was saying uh, upon reading uh, James, uh, this is James Flett's question. Uh, upon reading James's questions, of course, right, James is, uh, as he's always inclined to do, right, very able to sharply get at the heart of the problem. And I think the issue here is um, there's a disagreement as to which uh, pacta, right, was not kept. Uh, I think on one hand, you could look at the language, which uh, uh, the articles on the DSU itself, right? Uh, and certainly that's one point of view. Uh, there's another, which is with regards to, I think the view from Washington uh, would be more, there is a total bargain that was struck as part of the 1994 uh, reform package uh, of which elements of that was not kept, which has thrown things out of balance. Uh, there are certainly, uh, differences of view uh, between uh, U.S. and China as to what has been kept or not. Uh, I've written about, right, in terms of whether you look at the letter of the law or the spirit of the law or, or what the uh, purpose uh, is uh, behind the law itself. So I think in some ways, uh, it's even a more basic conversation uh, uh, asking uh, if even if we could agree upon Pacta Sunt Rwanda, there is a hierarchy amongst these uh, different types of right, what we would think about the Pacta and what falls into the package of that uh, that needs to be addressed. And that's a frank conversation that I think we're not quite ha having. Uh, the second question that was posed to me was uh, whether uh, the solution would be one that has mandatory and binding dispute settlement. And I, I think that's difficult uh, to say where uh, we would, uh, uh, where even today that question I, I think is not necessarily being robustly addressed in Washington because it depends as Tom Graham stated in his recent testimony uh, to Senate Finance Committee, it depends on all of the other pieces of uh, WTO reform. Uh, so it's difficult to sort of talk about in isolation uh, what that uh, would mean on that one particular issue without understanding all of the other elements of what would be put in place on uh, WTO reform. Uh, that I think uh, would be sort of where we stand right now in Washington. Of course, uh, within the Washington foreign policy establishment, you could find a whole wide range of uh, views. Some who view mandatory Biden dispute settlement as being absolutely critical and in the US's long-term interest and others who do not. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. And then uh, the question with regards to the specific article of the SU, um, I, I think uh, James meant to direct that to Stephen. So I'll defer to Stephen on that. Yeah, I'm happy to take. I'm happy to take that question. I mean, so the question is. Uh, on the subject of what has been agreed, Article 17.14 DSU, quote, an appellate body report should be adopted by the DSB and unconditionally accepted by the parties to the dispute unless the DSB decides by consensus not to adopt the appellate body report within 30 days following its circulation to the members. So I think there's a couple of, I guess the implied question here is, is apparently the Americans have just decided that whatever comes out of the appellate body is something that they will agree. Um, I guess if we're going to sort of go back and forth in terms of what's actually in, in the appellate body, we will all recall that Article 17.5 of the DSU says that in no case shall the proceedings of the appellate body exceed 90 days. Um, but apparently there are people at the WTO who believe that the appellate body can take more than 90 days uh, and issue a decision that is then binding on the U.S. under Article 17.14. Um, that that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Um, if if the text says that you have to issue within 90 days and you don't issue it within 90 days, then it seems to me that you don't actually have uh, you don't actually have a decision of the appellate body. Um, Article 3.2, of course, says recommendations and rulings of the DSB cannot add to or diminish the rights and obligations covered and provided in the covered agreements. And of course, as we know, the United States doesn't believe that the appellate body has complied with that rule as well. So I, I think that uh, we have a choice. We can either uh, quote text at each other and try to sue each other and try to force each other to do things uh, through a, a litigation process, or we can come together and have you know real practical conversations about um, what are the real differences here? What can we, what can we do? Uh, to work things out. I, I understand that a lot of people thought that in uh, 1994 and 1995, uh, the Americans had agreed uh, that they would pretty much do whatever the appellate body told them. Uh, but 
that's not what the Americans think. And I think you're going to find that whoever wins the next election, uh, I don't think he, he, anybody from America is going to come to Geneva and sit down and say, well, you guys rule and you tell us what our trade policy is going to be, and then that'll be our trade policy. I just, I don't think that's realistic. Now we can sort of have legal arguments and quote texts at each other and, and go back and forth over that. I would really like to take all of this out of the hands of the litigation people. I think there's been too many lawsuits. I mean, I'm a litigator. That's what I do. And I can tell you, we're not the best people to resolve uh, international differences. Um, we're going to always sue each other. We're going to always try to win lawsuits. We're going to look for texts and things that we can point to. We're going to press arguments uh, you, you know, to, the, to the nth degree. You, you don't want people like me you know, trying to resolve those type of disputes. Disputes among large nations need to be worked through by, you know, ambassadors and people who know how to negotiate and people who know how to see kind of the bigger picture. Um, there may be possibilities uh, there and going back to ancient time, I mean, going back to the 19th century in Geneva, there have been situations where negotiators thought it would be helpful to get guidance from arbitrators. Um, and that arbitrators could help them answer specific questions of fact, or sometimes even questions of law that would then feed into their negotiating process. But policymakers shouldn't really be taking orders from litigators. That's just not the way it should work. Thank you, Steve. And I'm cognizant of the time, but I do, since you mentioned ambassadors, I would like to give <laughs> Charlie the opportunity to say something about how would a diplomatic trade approach would look like under a Biden administration? Well, uh, let me just say, uh, first of all, it's been a very good discussion and I think uh, uh, put a lot of issues on the table and I hope the uh, participants have benefited from it. I would say as a, as a, 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 a diplomat, a former diplomat, a recovering diplomat, but also as a trade negotiator, I was a trade negotiator in NAFTA, as you mentioned at the outset, uh, I would say that uh, the reliability of your word, the PACTA aspect of, uh, of agreements reach matters. Of course it matters. I mean, you can't expect allies, you can't expect counterparties of any sort to be willing to make uh, concessions that are, that are bound up in an agreement unless you're reliable about how you carry forth the, the agreement. But the world changes, the, the problems change, and what is really important is to avoid posturing and uh, to build consensus for cooperation. And that's what we need to think about. And I think that the, uh, the next administration, whether it's uh, Biden or, uh, or Trump, but particularly if it is Biden, there will be a change in tone uh, in transatlantic affairs. Uh, and we will look to the EU to work with us to find solutions to difficult economic problems and other problems. Um, the EU, though, the Europeans collectively and individually need to respond to that. It is not going to be a situation where the United States under President uh, 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 President-elect Biden or, or, or and his administration is going to say, oh, well, uh, everything that uh, we stood for in the past, we don't stand for anymore. And we're going to uh, take our policy uh, lead from from Brussels. It, it takes two to negotiate. Uh, a negotiator's task is to look behind the guy at the table and find out what kinds of pressures he or she is under and to help he or she to find the solution that works for you, but that also helps with the pressures uh, behind the other side of the table. And, and I think the tactics of how to do that that's you know negotiable. I have an idea. I think that going back to the classic, the G7 would be really very helpful. But uh, fundamentally, we have to deal with the problems as they are and find solutions that work for now and as far into the future as we can see. I want to thank you, uh, each one of you, for, for bearing with me. This was an absolutely enriching uh, uh, session transatlantically. We look forward to inviting you here in London, hopefully uh, during better times, and to watch Hamilton as well here in London. That would be great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah,
Thank you very much, Malik, for uh, chairing this session. Thank you very much to the speakers for uh, the excellent presentations. Uh, these have been three terrific sessions. Uh, more eminent speakers and uh, insightful discussion is lined up for the panels tomorrow. Uh, we will start tomorrow at uh, 9 a.m. to accommodate the Asian and Middle East time zone. So uh, thank you very much again. Uh, see you tomorrow. Thank you.